can you kind of summarize what does Create Hackers do and how does it provide value to DJs? We help organize DJs messy music library. That's uh, in a nutshell what we do. We help them find the bangers faster. And mm. uh, we have software and a community that goes along with helping pick the hits. And uh, I'm usually there, kind of, kind of like you. I, I'm building a community and where we focus more on the music side of things, you would focus more on the business. Yeah. I think I love the community component. Of course, the technology is really awesome. But the community aspect really brings like another unique touch, something that can't be replicatable, right? So right. for instance, you've got some pretty big names in your community that are actually contributing their crates, aka playlists, to the community of DJs that are subscribed to your your membership, uh, mm -hmm. which is super cool, man. It's really cool to see like just from afar, like how you have contributed to the industry. So thank you very much for doing that as well. Um, oh, thank you. Like investment wise, like what is like what is a DJ looking at to spend on you know joining create hackers let's say we'll start off by giving them a free trial so they can kick the tires seven to 14 days we'll uh send them a link and we can get them to log in and check it out and download the software if they wanted to but otherwise it's uh 30 bucks a month and if you stick around for those cool black friday specials you can get in for the full year for a little under 200 bucks oh that is awesome i mean super affordable for what it does and uh, what I would say is like, you know, we're actually personal users as well uh, for, for my entertainment company back in California. Thank we you. love it. We love it. And uh, not only does it, you know, give you access to, let's say, hypothetically, if you're doing a cultural event for the first time, right? You've never right. done one before. You don't have any cultural context. You can go into Create Hackers. You can find someone who is an expert in that area, right? And you can right. download their crate, essentially the, the playlist. And know that like with full confidence that it's been vetted out and that you can, you know, play it. And most likely people are going to be dancing uh, on the dance floor. Because like you said, pick the bangers faster, right? Yep. Still got to read your crowd. Still got to push play at the right time at the right place. Sometimes some crates don't work in certain places, but that's where the DJ really does come in. But you mentioned community. And I think the thing that keeps them coming back more and more is the fact that music is a constant, ever-changing, always fresh topic. <laughs> I took like two months off with my music music library and I know you don't DJ as much but um, when you're in the game as much as you probably were you felt that anxiety of like two or three months go by and you think your crates are all stale and your playlists oh, are all <laughs> yeah. feeling it I, I had two months off and I'm like oh I get caught back up and I just realized that man music has changed so quickly just within less than 90 days that I feel out of touch and I think that's why we keep coming back to a community of DJs so they can yeah. kind of fill in the gaps and say, Hey mate, you missed this one. You forgot to play. Oh, don't play that one anymore. That one doesn't get a good reaction anymore. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's better to have a community of DJs who kind of have your back for the dance floor because really there are so many songs coming out of the pipeline every damn day that yeah. it's, we need some backup support. Would you happen to have that statistic of like on average, how many songs do get released on a daily basis? I could tell you that Spotify, probably the, the central hub of music new releases pushes out 120,000 new songs per day. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, even if you were an avid music researcher every day, that's still hard to keep up with. <laughs> right. 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 And I, even me being at the top of the edge of music discovery, you know, constantly working for the Create Hackers charts, I even I feel completely overwhelmed from time to time, even though I have the tools and the software to kind of filter it. But imagine somebody just walking in, wondering where to start. I and mean, how do you? Yeah. And I would say, you know, again, as a as a customer of yours, I've been really impressed with, um, you know, the, how the platform has evolved. So we were probably very early on. I have heard through the grapevine that you guys started off with just PDF download as mm. a playlist, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't enter at that phase. That, that would be like the early, early adopter phase for sure. Right. But like once you guys came out with like version one of the software, like that's how long we've been a part of that platform, uh, your platform. Mm -hmm. And how it's evolved, evolved has been so impressive. I mean, one of the features that are our team's most favorite is uh, with client requests, you know? So uh, primarily those of you that have followed the podcast, you know that I ran a private uh, entertainment uh, event entertainment company. So we primarily focus on private events, weddings, corporate events, schools, and, and that kind of stuff, you know, life celebrations. And um, there's a lot of straw requests that our clients want us to play for their events. And uh, you have figured out how to crack the code on being able to align the song requests against your actual music library within the, your DJ software. 
and figure out what songs are missing, what songs you have to be able to, to easily organize it into a, a crate or a playlist. And then also with a click of a button, depending on what record pool you're a part of, you can then easily <laughs> download those songs right. as well, which is just, <laughs> I mean, just simplifying the curation of crates, which is exactly the name, right? Crate Hackers. So it's, it's yep. just been yep. phenomenal to, to experience Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I know that you guys have some new things coming down the pipeline, right? So uh, there's a new release coming out, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a better version of, you, alluding to uh, the PDFs in the beginning, that's really all it was for me. The central focus is and always will be music discovery, and more importantly, what mixes best next. I think that was kind of the key signature secret sauce. Uh, it didn't kind of hit them in the face until they started listening to the transitions, but when you yeah. pop open one of those playlists, I designed them to where they could just be completely uh, harmonically and tempo compatible. So one of the features that I loved was just stacking up songs on top of another, even if it had to be in a PDF list. And that's really all it was at one point, which is a notepad. Like I knew for a fact that Bruno Mars mixed really well into Wild Cherry, mixed really well into Justin Timberlake. And I made that list and people seem to enjoy that. And I don't think it could survive much today <laughs> with all the new technology but thank goodness we called ourselves crate hackers because hackers in general people who love to be more efficient came to me and said we could do this better and that's when i found a great team of people and i started to manage and um much like the multi-op that i was working at in nashville i had a staff of djs who i uh, would help book for events real events and then i'd be over here working with my virtual community the hackers mm. and they would be working on possible inventions uh in terms of software for example we i never would have had the software were it not for helping manage and be a part of this uh other side of the world for a while yeah. juggling both for a good long while until i finally found my rhythm love it love it and so in regards to this new release are you able to tease a little bit of like what what you know current customers can expect and even people that are on the fence about joining cray hackers what they can expect yeah, the constant evolution is just new innovation, new new coat of paint, new things to click. <laughs> awesome. I would say that this particular version, Crate Hackers 4.0, is a rewrite from the ground up. Have you ever started your collection from the ground up before, or maybe just a, you know, your Word documents? Just literally, oh yeah, blank page, <laughs> and it. Rebuild we figured that yeah. you've been there before, and I think that if you if you build your foundation stronger you can be a little bit more future proof and add more bells and whistles so we had to take our development team and i'm not i'm not much of a code are you much of a coder do you not much I basic code but yeah i so, delegate that stuff out <laughs> right exactly exactly yeah. I, I just trust that the team is going to be working on a platform that is a different kind of code base and it allows them to it's it's taking a little while longer but it's going to be a complete rewrite allowing us a chance to add more innovation and features uh, with 5.0 and 6.0 and beyond. I think um, what I'm hearing here is something that I love to coach around, which is you know what I tell my coach clients constantly, is sometimes you have to slow down in order to speed up, right? We're so obsessed about just moving forward, moving forward, progression, progression, right? Like, let's check this goal off the list and this goal off the list, right? Versus like right. sometimes in order to exponentially grow, right? And reach exponential goals, you have to slow down and sometimes break things and rebuild them from, from the ground up in Very order good. to yeah, give yourself point. that possibility we, to reach that point, right? I'm one of the most impatient guys on my team, I think. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I do push for innovation fast because I kind of know what our competition is looking like with AI and, and all that, mm -hmm. that I would love to say I could move fast at this point, but you're right. We are in that phase where we have to slow down and we have to realize that if we don't build this firm foundation first, it could just mm -hmm. topple over. So while I am being uh, a little more impatient in this, uh, in this waiting game, it does feel like the wait will be worth it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Nobody yeah. wants it as fast as I do, but I have a feeling once it comes out, it's going to be so rock solid. So yeah, really happy about that. Well, we're very excited about the 4.0 release and Thanks. Uh, we're, look, we're very much looking forward to it for sure. Awesome. Tell me this, like what in your opinion makes a great crate? Well, back when I was um, reorganizing my music uh, before the show, again, I'm looking at this crate that was two months old. Mm -hmm. First thing I'm thinking is, can I still get away with some of these songs? Can... Can I get rid of the songs that don't serve me any longer? And that's the first thing I look at when I look at really anything in life, to be honest. But <laughs> in general, crates deserve some pruning, kind of like a beautiful garden. You have to kind of pull out the songs, even though it hurts to let go of that personal favorite song. I mean, 
Yeah. There might be some tracks in there that you personally love, but is it going to work with the dance floor? It's you know, probably not. And yeah, you have to have those conversations with yourself as you're going through your playlists. And then I think a good crate has to stay within some parameters. It has to be a bushel of songs that are all within the same maybe decade or genre, however you decide to organize. So if it's 1990s, just keep it strictly 1990s. Don't let some 80s and 70s fall in the mix. Um, mm. If it's Moombaton, make sure that it is the most pure Moombaton possible because some other versions of uh, Latin music could fall in or different styles could just drop that may not complement the crate. So I, I really get nerdy about this to be honest i'm probably yeah, yeah. the most hyper organized crate guy out there <laughs> just because it means so much to me to keep it on rails so what you're saying is keep it nice and clean clean and pure per genre base or per whatever you're trying to achieve with that crate uh, yeah one or the other if not both i think if you were to start and build your crates i would go genre more importantly if you want to get more finite get down to the decades from that point on maybe subfolders and that's probably the best way to start Love it. Okay. I think I've got a really interesting question for you. You probably don't get asked this very often, Ooh. but I think you're just the right person to ask this question. I think you're probably the, one of the only ones that can answer this question, That's which is you are, you, you, you are a manager at a pretty large multi-op, right? Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, you're also part of Crate Hackers, right? So you, you understand how to curate crates and you literally have this very unique perspective of looking inside of multiple DJs, I mean, DJs across the world, right? Like their crates and how they yeah. design them and so forth. For a multi-op owner that's having the challenge of like, okay, I've gone from single op, right? Having my own music library. How do I replicate the music library across multiple DJs in my company? And what would you suggest? Do they all have their own unique libraries? Should it be standardized where every single crate is identical to the next, mm. uh, you know, unit? What is, what is your thought process behind that? Wow. Okay, I might be able to answer that. Let's see. Where do I start? <laughs> um, thank you for that. I would say Nashville, Tennessee is a great melting pot for diversity. And uh, it's not just country. Uh, I know we have that label, but it is Music yeah. City in, in general. <laughs> yeah. And I believe that you have to have a multi-op of varied tastes and styles, all colors and, and walks of life. I believe in order to get yourself the most bookings with a multi-op, you have to have variety on your staff. So mm -hmm. that in itself is going to, you know, give the diversity in, in terms of crates. You, every person's playlist is going to be different, I believe. However, then you have to look at your market. So then you see what the market requires. Um, we have a very large Latin community here in Nashville. Um, so we have some experts in that field. And then we have some straight across Southern weddings where you, know, you take over those barns, um, those outdoor venues, barbecues, things like that. And so there's particular playlists for that. And um, DJs play a really unique role in this market, particularly because we are in Music City. And so we do have bands and we have specifically country bands who can do a really good job. Mm -hmm. And so they handle a majority of the country music and the, the rock and Southern soul. Like DJs don't play that because they've got it. Uh, we mm. are kind of in our own lane with EDM and rap and pop music and, and wedding hits and such. So that kind of, again, just knowing your market uh, really helps you manage all that but in particular if you are an owner of a multi-op have a diversified staff allow them to bring their own tastes to the table but you kind of have to do an overview of what their uh, playlists look like mm -hmm. maybe go and ask them just on the spot hey i'd love to see the history of what you played last week at your wedding show me your serato history and uh, yeah. i'd love to review it with you we call those air checks. Uh, I, I come from a radio background where yeah. that's why the, the charts are so important to me. Um, mm, makes sense. Watching the charts move up and down the radio was super interesting to me. So I brought that to my multi-op and I, I would spot check them, air check them and say, hey, show me what that last show sounded like. Let's take mm -hmm. a look and maybe as a manager just sort of say, well, why did you play this song? Did it really get a good reaction? Maybe you'll learn some things yourself, but that would probably be the best way to keep those playlists and just that overall vibe and check uh it's, it's hard nerve-wracking in fact when you send out in my case it was 25 djs all across nashville that morning after 
that, that Sunday morning, you're just crossing your fingers. You're not getting that phone call that, yeah, you know, right. one of those 25 screwed up because they played the wrong song at the wrong time. So Absolutely. it's a lot of upkeep. Responsibility, but, right? Yeah. Yeah. Last thing I would bring up would be we host what's known as hackathons in the Cray Hackers community. It's a little nerdy sounding, but really it is just DJs coming together and talking about music for an hour every Tuesday. So we would talk about pop music for an hour and you know, get DJs from all across the nation to chime in. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we come up with a really cool playlist of people chiming in. What songs should we should stay? What, what should we go away? If you can do that locally, in other words, make that part of one of your training semi-annual sessions, maybe in between. In fact, this would be the perfect time to do it because the wedding season is Absolutely, wrapping up. Yeah. 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 New Year's Eve, maybe after that, between then and March, do a hackathon. You know, bring your DJs together. Everyone bring their laptops. Let's all just kind of feed off of each other and get a general sense of what worked and what uh, what we can learn from each other. That would be the best advice I got. Mm, that's such great advice. Absolutely. For those of you that may not know what hackathon is, Aaron, could you like define what hackathon means? Sure. Yeah. It, it's for some, you would think it requires coding, which Ben and I both are not, you know, <laughs> but we love the term. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It really is just a, a meeting of minds. For example, Ben is doing a prom. Let's say Ben's going to go do a prom and He's going to tune into an episode and there's going to be other DJs out there who are wanting to learn about proms or are experts in proms. And then we'll have the chat room open where we'll ask, okay, real quick, what was your favorite song of the season so far? What song got the best reaction? And they'd all type it in. And then we would vote mm. songs up and vote songs down. And at the end of the episode, we'd have a pretty general sense of what songs work in a prom environment. And that's what hackathons are. So in other words, it's, it's master yeah, exactly. right? So it's sharing knowledge uh, from actual experience, but also a little bit of brainstorming of new ideas that could also be added to the mix as well, right? So it's like the beautiful blending of multiple minds right, together. Right, and much like your uh, that, masterminds that you carry with your community, the same goes for us, but it's always constantly evolving. Um, the pop playlist is going to be different in 2024 versus what it's going to be like in 2023. So we'll never run Absolutely. out of music. Yeah. Which is great, you know, it's, it, it keeps the creative juices flowing as well, right? Because as DJs, we have to stay on top of the trends. We have to stay relevant and so forth. So I think that there's a huge opportunity for you guys to serve the community, but also then huge value that, you know, all you DJs can actually receive from Crate Hackers by being a part of that. Well, even well. without Crate Hackers, yeah. I would still encourage anybody who's got a crew of DJ friends, share your secrets, start talking about music more. I don't think we as a community or as an industry talk about music enough. So if I could get any kind of message out on your podcast today, it's we need to start talking about music more. And so um, if I can help guide that, then mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. Let's stay here for a little bit because you know our industry, depending on what circles you're in, right? There's a little bit of puffing of the chest, the ego, right? There's a little bit of our history from uh, as DJs. I come primarily from a hip hop okay. background. So I started off as a B-boy, you know, got into break I dancing. I can see that. Uh, <laughs> I, I was never really an MC, like a rapper. Uh, I got a little bit into graffiti as well, uh, but then DJing really was the thing sure. that, like I fell in love with. And culturally, right, it was DJs were about actually literally white labeling the <laughs> records to make sure that nobody would bite their style, right? right? So I think there's a little bit in, uh, infused in our culture and our history as DJs of like that's still being very relevant and alive right. today. What kind of advice could you give or encourage words of encouragement could you give to our community of what you want was which is essentially let let's open up the vault let's actually let people yeah. in and see how our minds work and how we choose songs and so forth it's so funny you bring up the white label because that was the first thing that turned me off against the people i looked up to i would show up at these clubs and these djs would walk in with uh for those that are uh, are aware of what a white label is you're literally covering the label of your record and you're putting it on the platter and the dj behind you or the audience can't even tell what you're playing i, I always thought to myself wait that was somebody else's song to begin with you didn't make that um back in that day that you probably didn't make that and it was somebody else who sang it maybe another record label that pressed it maybe it was you know some creditors and writers and producers and you you just completely took credit for that and now you're telling me that i can't see it <laughs> because it's yours <laughs> that yeah, that part yeah. <laughs> really threw me through a loop and that has prevailed for years I, i've never quite understood why djs were so secretive up until 
just it point blank hit me in the face. The truth is, they're afraid you're going to take their job. I think we got bigger things to worry about nowadays. I really think that our jobs are being taken away by m much grander, much larger things. I don't know if you're noticing, but we're losing dance floors left and right. London, England alone lost 122 clubs shortly after COVID. I'm not talking about during COVID. I mean, yeah. they are losing, we are losing dance floors to uh, dinner tables and to other businesses. And mm -hmm. that wasn't the DJ's fault. Uh, that wasn't the DJ's. The, the, the DJ behind you who was looking over your shoulder was hoping to carry on the torch and hoping to carry on the sure. energy and, and give people a, a, a chance to come together. Um, yeah, I, I'm standing on my soapbox a little bit when I talk about this, but I really, no, I was, I love a, this. I I was love truly this, yeah. uh, turned off by those people who didn't share their secrets because we will lose this industry if we don't pass what we know along. You have a whole unique perspective there where it's partially an abundance mindset versus a scarcity mindset of like, hey, uh, we can gain way more by collaborating and helping one another by protecting our, our industry, mm -hmm. right? But the scarcity side is that if we don't, we might lose there our industry, go. right? Well, let's also face it. <laughs> yeah. This is a fun conversation to have. Um, we love having this conversation with other DJs uh, and it's so exciting and unpredictable and getting another person's opinions. Um, Either it helps us validate our choices, like, oh, wow, I, I was right, this song is a smash, or I needed to hear that. Um, why Why we never did that before? It, it just uh, It is a scarcity feeling. People feel like they don't have enough opportunity, and yet they're worried about somebody else online hundreds and thousands of miles away is going to take their gig. I, I just uh, I feel we yeah. have bigger problems. I'm curious to find out. This is something that we should check. DJ AM. And Serato actually like, came out with a DJ AM feature, which was to white label. I recall. I, I remember primarily it was on Scratch Live. I don't know if like it's still alive in, in you know um, Serato Pro now, uh, but that'd be kind of a unique thing to kind of check and see if that's still a feature. <laughs> <laughs> which essentially like hid all the song, you know, like where the song title and artist would usually be, it would hide that. So that way uh, DJs looking over your shoulder on your laptop screen couldn't even see what you're playing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it exists, and uh, a, you know, digital white label. It's just complementing what the current culture is standing for at this moment. I believe some people subscribe to it. Some yeah, people. Yeah, it's Serato's fault. I think they were just listening to the culture mm -hmm. for sure. You have a lot of a ton of experience in regards to managing a multi-op. So we've got some multi-op owners here that are listening to the show. First and foremost, what were you mainly responsible for uh, with your position inside the multi-op? I came from a small town in Montana to Nashville. And I met a gentleman by the name of Jason who ran a company here that's been around for about 10 to 15 years prior before, before I was around. And simply by just Googling DJs in Nashville, I came across this company and it was much like many of your listeners. They started off as one DJ who just got double, triple booked and decided they had to start branching out and bringing more people in. And I came in at about that time where he was about eight to 10 DJs that he trusted and so on and gotcha. at first they wanted me to sell they, they said get out there and go sell and again that's hard for somebody who again is not a seller i don't sell very well let alone mm -hmm. know anything about the town i was in i don't know if you ever had a sales position in a brand new city but a you brand got, new city right right you, you don't have any <laughs> yeah. connections lack of connections right like you just yeah. come across as this guy that is trying to sell if you're not building a good relationship so that was so tough for me i think they started to realize where my strengths were and that was helping obviously with playlists and also managing the staff in terms of the technical side i always thought that if i never had a, a job working for a multi-op i'd probably do a really good job working at Guitar Center. <laughs> so any mm. speaker problems, any up lights, any cords, cables, adapters, so on. I was uh, a really uh, efficient person when it came to that. And Nashville, we don't really necessarily have big, elaborate sound systems. You've seen some of those in New Jersey or New York, like Jason Janai. They, they come up with these walls of speakers and intelligent lighting that yeah, is yeah. all you know, DMXed and so on. But we, we run really lean for such a small... Um, we're a mid-sized town, but we have very small spaces. So my job was to make sure that each of their, each of the DJs had the minimum amount. You know, did they have a gig bar? Did they have two 15s, um, thousand watts at least? Um, making sure that all their gear was good. And then weekends after weekends, it would be okay. Who has the uplights? 
<laughs> bring him back to the office. We need to get him out. Oh, who has the photo booth? Okay, bring it back. Oh, we had to do some repairs. So a lot of that was my job in the beginning. And more importantly, just training him how to be efficient and then how to speak on the microphone too. Uh, I would go back and forth with the owner and we would do these MC training workshops. And with my radio background, that was super fun because you'd see these DJs who were really efficient on the turntables, but you give them a microphone and they would fall apart. Mm, yeah. I thought that was a, a missing element that I could bring to the table. And Toastmaster classes, a lot of improv. Let's see what we can do to just loosen these guys up. And we have some DJs who are still doing it today uh, from my teachings. And it's nice to see. Uh, I think you know, when you give a person the ability to talk and talk confidently, and engage with the crowd. Yeah. If you can get that under their belt just a couple of times, you can see their confidence increase. And I love seeing Absolutely. these younger kids just blossom just with a few lessons of how to even talk on a microphone, where to position the mic. And when it came to the selling, I was not very good at it. <laughs> when it came to the training and just how to get that event in motion, that's where I came into play. And uh, towards the end, we were doing a thousand events a year and we had 25 djs and uh that was about my breaking point before i <laughs> couldn't handle much longer but <laughs> it, it, it goes to show that we could get efficient and fast and nimble um in a short amount of time just with the right kind of training so yeah i i can relate to that man i i always loved seeing a you know shy person on the microphone maybe not shy personality wise because they were very confident on the decks but when it came to rocking yeah. the mic they were just really shy on getting on that microphone mm -hmm. right and you notice that they djs are actually there's a lot of personality style uh you know when it, when it comes to dj specifically that are not focused on mc work that tend to be a little more introverted too right so uh, we have this misconception that like djs are these outward you know very confident flamboyant people that just you know because they're party boys they're able, are in girls right they're able to connect with any anybody and there's just extroverts and it's just like no what i've come to find is that the majority of us are tend to be actually introverts. oh i put a post up <laughs> we like to hide behind the decks right instead of socializing in the i don't crowd. know if you saw that on my facebook but i did post that i said i think djs are the most introverted people in the world and 300 comments mm. later the truth is i was speaking to my therapist, um, you're not cool unless you got a therapist this day and age, by the way, you need one. <laughs> Everyone mm -hmm. does. But Love my particular <laughs> therapist said, well, of course you're an introvert. And he explained it perfectly because number one, when you go to a social environment as a DJ, you are mm -hmm. physically and metaphorically putting a uh, space between you and the others. And you can see it right now with this. I've got this between you and me. And it's always been that way. Yeah. So me being really approachable, not so much, especially when it's, you know, you're behind the DJ booth and you have headphones on, like how social can you be? Yeah. <laughs> and then no, I said, I said, well, no. wait, hold on. That's not true. Mr. Therapist. I said, I said, I, I'm on radio. I, I, I talk for a living. I'm social all the time. He's like, yeah, but you're in a room talking to yourself. <laughs> you don't hear the other side of the conversation. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I'm yeah, an yeah. introvert. And it's so true. I would say like, you know, behind the decks is, is definitely like our comfort zone, right? It's our, our safety zone, our safety. How do you feel when you go for. and you're not DJing? Are, are you, are you a little skittish or what do you like when you're in environments where you're not the DJ? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Yeah. Like my comfort zone is actually on stage in front right. of a crowd versus being in the crowd. Right. Like I actually don't enjoy going to concerts or clubs. Like I'd rather be the person that's the rock in the club or, you know, just, just, just a part of the, well, it makes sense because you're kind of a dance floor. I sense that you're an empath, right? You can, yeah, you can read the yeah, audience's yeah. energy just by walking absolutely. into a room. It's perfect that you're a DJ because you can change the mood how you want it to be. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty powerful weapon to have, um, especially for somebody who's an empath or an introvert. Like you want to change it up. All right, push play on another song. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I Man, I love that perspective that you provided, though. Um, that even in a, you know, as a radio host, you still are in a room by yourself, right? so, <laughs> in a soundproof it's, it's padded room, room, no less. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I mentioned it was that you know to take a person that was shy on the microphone, and then 
you know, over time with lots of training and, and practice and experience, they become really confident on the microphone. They actually become more confident in just regular social um, settings as well. So that's been a really cool thing to witness. Because one thing that we always, uh, you know, one of our core values is to focus not only on the growth for the company, but on the growth for the person to impact their life as well. So we never try to just teach things or give things, you know, knowledge, uh, you know, teach around knowledge for our team members just to become better DJs or better employees for our company. We actually focus on how do we help make you a better right. person? Because even once you leave this company, let's say, uh, you just, you know, you can affect your network of people. Maybe, you, you know, you're a brother or sibling or maybe you're, uh, you know, a, f a friend and you can actually now affect your community based off the skills that mm. you learned here. We don't call the people so, who um, quit our multi-op uh, quitters. We call them graduates. Mm, they just move on. They just move on. And we hope that they carry yeah. on some of those uh, characteristics that they learned from, from us. They graduated on to the next level. Oh, that's such a great perspective too. Yeah. 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 Look at you just dropping golden nuggets <laughs> on <all> this podcast. <laughs> no. It, well, what has been your most favorite experience or thing, uh, you know, being a manager inside of a multi out? Well, I'm not getting any younger. And this is my year that uh, I decided to retire. Uh, believe it or not, mm. I, I, I just wrapped up my thousandth event in Nashville, working here eight years. And obviously, with Crate Hackers doing so well, I can be a little bit more free uh in terms of that so the only reason why i decided i could leave and retire is because i confidently feel that i've been able to take a staff and let them run the day-to-day -day operations without much more intervention on my part uh, and that goes for both cray hackers mm -hmm. and the multi-op um we have trained our replacements and that should not be an insult to you if you're considering that you you are your only person, but you do also, you, you really should, if you're a multi-op owner, be considering having someone replace you or clone you or take your job in the future because you're going to get older. You're going to maybe lose relevance or maybe not be as cool as you used to be. Maybe you're going to be that, you know, the guy who throws dad jokes around and d daughter rolls her eyes. That's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. It's <laughs> at that that's age where, where I'm at too. I was just going to say, once you become a dad, you lose. Yeah. Yeah. It starts going downhill. <laughs> I caught that. Yeah. And I said, okay, I realized that uh, I, at some point I'm probably going to lose touch with the younger audience. So I need to find someone or some people who can take this and carry it on. I have some visions that I, and, and some, some rules that I want to keep in place to keep the legacy going. Mm -hmm. But the most exciting part of all this, of, of training them all, is being able to see their stream of posts and videos and say, I, I, I had a little something to do with that. I'm living vicariously yeah. through the success of others. Um, nothing more profound to me than one time when I was working over at Cray Hackers and um, somebody had asked for a Yacht Rock playlist. Yeah, you know what Yacht Rock is, right? Like the Daryl Hall, John Oates, Neil Diamond, the classic just... Oh, like, gotcha, okay. And yeah. he was really kind of out of touch with that music. Um, I put one together and then he posted on Facebook. He was working at Carnival Cruise Lines and he was cruising past Jamaica. You can see the island in the background and he was DJing that playlist on that boat. And I was like whoa <laughs> i had something to do That's with so that cool. and you know you're yeah, seeing like the cray hacker yeah. software pop up at sold out stadiums or sporting events or so and i'm just like okay i don't need to be around much anymore the, the team has got me and that's yeah, the most rewarding yeah. part of being a manager is when you can when you can put down your defenses and realize that there are people as good as you maybe not well maybe not be as better maybe not be better than you but on your same level once you can relinquish a little bit of that control and give it to them you're gonna you're gonna do just fine uh, you ever watch the show bar rescue oh yeah absolutely john taffer, john taffer. <laughs> the common thread yep. through that entire show every season was always that one manager owner that didn't want to give up any kind of control. control they were always too yeah, reluctant yeah. to give control to a bartender a staff member somebody underneath them because they were too prideful to let the name be passed down so if you can get over that and that's the toughest part if you can just say listen i trust you you are my clone you you get me you know find those one mm -hmm. or two people and then 
live vicariously through them. I understand from the other person's perspective how why it's so challenging, right? Because this is something that has brought you a certain level of success, right? You becoming a DJ wasn't easy. Learning how, you know, a lot of us actually learned from a distance. Like we didn't even have mentors or coaches. Like, you know, nowadays you can just sign up for a coaching program or a, or buy a, a self-study course or even go on YouTube university. Right. And you can learn how to right. DJ. Um, I don't know how, how long you've been a DJ for, but I didn't have that luxury. <laughs> <laughs> I just studied for DJs from afar. Right. And it took me close to two years to learn, you know, to teach, teach myself Same. how to DJ or try to put the puzzle pieces together from afar. Right. right? Um, and so I can see how a lot of DJs that are in that role of, okay, I want to scale my company. I've got a couple of, you know, uh, DJs, uh, that are now working within in the company, but I still can't give up control. One of the reasons why it seems, and I, I remember doing the same thing where I told myself, well, what got me here, I just, you know, it, it already got me a certain level of success. So let me just keep doing more of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Which then keeps us stagnant and stuck actually in that plateau because right. you can't graduate to the next level unless you're willing to shed your identity from the level that you're within. So what worked, what got you here, won't get you there. Right. That's, that's where that saying comes from, which is super challenging. Yeah. It's a, cause like you said, it's, you, you have to reflect on your ego. You have to put the ego aside, but you almost have to kill a part of you as well. That like might be d near and dear to you. Yeah. You can only handle so many things at once. And if you feel like you can spread yourself out that thin, measure the data, see if it's actually true. Can you truly do more than one thing at a time? You know, over time, your sales are going to prove otherwise or, or point you in the right direction. Once you start to see yourself slip, it's not time to quit. It's simply time to delegate. Who's better than that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, who's better at that realm than you? It's tough. I mean, like the saying goes, where attention goes, success grows. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very mindful of where your attention goes, right? If it only goes into the next piece of equipment that you're purchasing, your sets and all that kind of stuff, well, you'll continue to grow as a DJ, but you won't con continue to grow as a leader or the CEO or general manager of your company, yeah, yeah, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. I mean, it was so tough for me to fire myself because I, I got into DJing because I loved, I mean, that's the whole reason why, why I became a DJ is because I love DJing, right? So it's like to fire yourself from working events. I mean, that's a very hard thing to give up on. You know, another thing that was really hard actually mm -hmm. for me, I don't know if you had to go through this. Uh, my, my DJ alias was Music Element and I had Music Element on all my social media handles for okay. years. And even after I stopped working at events, I still couldn't change that name for a good two years. Cause I was still like, it was still that special part of me that I wanted to hold on oh, to. Oh, I see. I see. And one day I was just so fed up and I was like, no, Ben, you know what? I need to move on. So I literally changed it to at Ben Sean Herman on all social media platforms instead of at music element. Cause that's what it used to be. <laughs> Similar situation. The silly, it's the silly games that we, we play. Well, right? it's, it's amazing how much you can shed if you do decide to get rid of one avatar and replace it with another. Um, there have been times where my Facebook account has been literally hacked itself and I had to start over again, but mm. you know, carry over necessarily everybody from that account into a new one. You bring over the people that matter. And I think you start to selectively decide mm. from that point on. Um, and you never know who you may cross paths with. And uh, it'd be fun to go back to your old and see if there's somebody that you could you know, reunite with from time to time. But think of them as just different chapters. You, that that was a part of you that um, probably was hard to break up with, but wouldn't you say the you know, Ben Sean Herman is the stronger version? No, I would say. Uh, I would say different. Different. different? Well, I like this version personally. Uh, I think I'm I'm continuing to. I think uh, yeah, to grow stronger is a, a continued process. Yeah, right? it is. Uh, I, I'm also a strong believer that I never want to accept that I'm I've made it because. Second that you accept that you've made it, that's usually when you tend to grow, mm -hmm. give up, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so, so I've got this fear also of like, I don't want to admit. So I continue just to be in the mindset of like, no, I need to continue to work on myself. Yeah. So, you know, just 1% a day improvement over you know, an entire year is 365% growth, right? Wow. Yeah, I guess. So that's when that's you do the math. Things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm seeing your hustle. Yeah, and I yeah. really see the... Uh, a good version of you currently. So I can't imagine what 365% oh, would look like. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about, um, 
surrounding yourself around the right people because i i've heard you say that as well throughout this this conversation mm -hmm. that you know you're thankful of the people that you surround yourself with create hackers that you feel like you wouldn't have gotten create hackers to the point that it is without certain key players within it mm -hmm. right and even with your team over at the multi-op right <sighs> Someone that's looking for their their tribe, looking for that next key player that needs to join their team. Mm. What kind of advice would you okay. give? Okay, yeah. Um, it's funny because whenever I say this term, people say they've heard it before, but for me, it was something I just heard. Um, mm. But I'll repeat it. Um, you are the average of the five people you hang out with most. You ever heard mm. that? Yep. Yeah. So oh, yeah, I, I, I realized that later on in life and I looked at that point in time when somebody said that to me, I, I looked at my five friends. I'm like, okay, y'all got to go. <laughs> you all got you all to get out of here. No, I'm kidding. I, I would yeah. say that at any point in your life, you just got to stop and, and look at the people that you're around. Um, there's, there's certain qualities that you can bring to a team that are far more powerful than you individually on your own. Why do you think they teach basketball? Why do you think they teach football? Why do you think they teach teamwork in school? I'm watching my nephew right now in Orlando. I go down and I watch his uh, karate games, right? You know, his basketball games. And a couple years ago, I would see him just get so frustrated when his uh, team lost or, or worse still, he would be a ball hog and his team would mm -hmm. lose. And he'd be like, why did we lose? Well, because, yeah. you know, I hate to break it to you, kid, but <laughs> it was kind of about you. And these things that you have to learn are so important. You know, teamwork is so crucial. For me, I, I think that's just one of the biggest lessons of, of DJing is, man, if you, can't, if you can't rely on the people around you, um, you're not going to last very long. Uh, I am not a great marketer at all um wouldn't even know where to start i have a message i want to get out there um but how do i get that word out with marketing well you find that one person uh, in my world dominic you know, he's an incredible marketer he transformed the landscape of of uh advertising for djs and uh, i wanted to find him I, I, he was one of the five people i wanted to surround myself around with um joe bonna obviously up in there in the top five and then glenn renda the developer and then uh i i saved the other two just for you know swap in swap outs you know i, I have my core three my owners with crate hackers and then i have my you know, mm. other two people that i that i'm that kind of rotate and rotate out but you 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 find your core and you just realize that you know, much like these owners at bar rescue you can't do everything at once. You have to delegate. You have to trust. You that, that's the key. That's so that's the end of it all. Uh, honestly, trust when it comes to managing a multi-op, when it comes to that uh that DJ on stage with the white label, um it's a matter of trust. These DJs don't trust you. That's mm -hmm. why they're covering up their labels. These you know, you you, you have people in your company because you hopefully trust them um at the end of the day we just want to be able to know that we can get our vision out there with the help of trusting others and that's a game we play oh my gosh yeah. again another golden nugget for everybody thank you so much man <laughs> for just all the wisdom and the the knowledge that you're willing to share with the community happy to help how can people stay in touch with you and find out more about you like uh do you want to share some of your social, you know, your personal social media? So, oh profiles? yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, you can find us on YouTube at Crate Hackers, and uh, just search Aaron Trailer anywhere. And I'd love to talk with you some more. I'd love to do uh, vicariously live through your success as well. <laughs> awesome. And then what about? Uh, yeah. So for people that want to find out more about Crate Hackers, how can they uh, either join or you know find out more about uh, the? Yeah, software? I will um, pass along a link to your members. You can go ahead and drop it into the the comments or awesome. wherever you post it. I'll give you all a yeah show notes. Yeah, I'll give you a seven day uh, free trial and hang out for a hackathon. I'd love to have you join us and love to bring Ben on for a hackathon at some point. You say that uh, you're focused more on the on the business side of things, but I'd love to see what. Can I send my general manager with that? <laughs> there you go. Well, send, yeah, there you go. That's what you're doing. You're putting some trust there in the person go. with the uh, with the right kind of knowledge. Absolutely, absolutely. He's a way better. You know, I was just gonna mention like I I didn't want to interrupt your thought, but like 
there's a part of like, you know, you want your staff to almost, you're not, you're not threatened by having people become as good right. as you, right? But honestly, like, I think the next level of leadership is like where you're actually excited about getting people to become better than you even. That's it, it. right? Because that means you can truly replace yourself because they're actually going to do a better job than you. You're going to start to see in point. the future, so, yeah. I'll be putting my money where my mouth is. And in 2024, I'll be stepping down as host of hackathons in general in, in a way to bring up the other people. I, I see people like Justin, the DJ, Drew and Fuse, mm -hmm. um, love to bring Joe Budden in, um, and just pass it. I figure crate hackers is plural. It's not just me. And that's the way you should all think yeah. about this. I mean, this is more than just you. It always will be more than just you. So bring in and invite and train and awesome. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Aaron. Thank you so much for being on the show Thanks, and I hope to have you back sometime. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you.